and here he's nailed it, in communism, the party is God. You owe your loyalties to it ahead of even uh, your loved ones, your community, even your nation. Your first loyalties are to the party, it is God, and it will determine, and it will vary from time to time, what is wrong and what is right, what is moral and what is immoral. How do we understand, uh, you're a foreign affairs expert as much as uh, a man who understands faith, the religious nature uh, of communism in an age when it's very hard for us to understand the strength of religious belief. Well, John, I'm thrilled that you lighted on that passage because I, I, there are two chapters on Chinese Christians in the book. And Chinese Christians are magnificent. And uh, the expansion of Christianity in China has been one of the fabulous stories of the last hundred years. You know, in 1949, when the communists took over, there were three or four million Chinese Christians. There are now somewhere between 60 million and 120 million. For reasons I outline in the book, it's very, very hard to get an accurate picture. But even if it's the lower figure of 60 million, to go from 3 million to 60 million under the enormous persecution that Christians have faced almost relentlessly, and certainly much more today than 10 years ago in China, is an astonishing um, growth of Christianity. But I do believe that uh, the academic you quote and another academic, Jeremy Barme, uh, convinced me completely and my own long experience of the Cold War, communism in a sense was always a competing religious view to Christianity. Now communism fell in the Soviet Union and we stupidly thought that meant the end of communism. Whereas in fact, the biggest, most powerful communist country in the world is China. And the idea that the Chinese Communist Party does not have ideology is utterly foolish. So the Chinese Communist Party I agree with the academic you quoted and with other academics, is inherently a religious organization. It's best to understand Chinese communism as one of the great world religions. And it's natural in a sense that the Chinese Communist Party see Christianity as a competitor because it offers an alternative plausibility structure, an alternative belief structure. So communism has, in a sense, always been a religion, but Chinese communism is a particular religion. What do I mean when I say that? It provides a total view of the human experience. It explains all of the human experience from birth to death and beyond. It, uh, it is very scriptural. It is full of the study of its own sacred scriptures, and it adds to its sacred scriptures and very occasionally subtracts from its straight sacred scriptures. It has its own metaphysics. It, one of its purposes is to provide an existential meaning and purpose to the lives of Chinese citizens. So the purpose of the Chinese citizen in, in Communist Party terms is to advance the interests of the Chinese Communist Party, advance the interests of the Chinese nation, and complete the revolution of the proletariat and the creation of the perfectly just society, which the communist society will be uh, in due course. The um, Chinese Communist Party has its eternal teachings, which it calls Marxism-Leninism thought, and it has its specific teachings for today, which it calls Mao Zedong thought. So the eternal principles of Marxism-Leninism, and then it adapts those eternal principles to the period of, the, of history that it's living through, and the, the label that it uses for that is Mao Zedong thought. Jeremy Barme, a brilliant, brilliant sinologist whom I quote in the book, makes the point that the Chinese were tremendously influenced by Stalin uh, in a positive way. They, they didn't regard Stalin as a bad guy, you know, murderer of tens of millions of people. The Chinese Communist Party murdered tens of millions of people. It was well and truly on a league with Stalin. But it, it accepted much of the culture of communism that Stalin brought. Now, for a time, it sort of rejected Marxist economics, but it never completely rejected Marxist economics. And now it's much more emphasizes state assets and state leadership in, in the economy. But the real point of Marxism-Leninism is in the Leninism and the practice of Stalin. And all of that is about state power, party power, and reforming the individual human mind. Now, Stalin was a, was a horrible murderous communist dictator, 
But he did, as a matter of fact, attend a Russian Orthodox seminary as a young man. He never aspired to the priesthood. He was never religious or anything, but, but he did attend. Um, uh, this was the best way for his family to get him an education. He had a very dysfunctional family. And he uh, imported into his practice of communism a good deal of the methodology of Eastern Christianity. And this has found its way into communism, uh, into Chinese communism. So the practice of the confessional, the public confession, confessing your sins against the party. And this is the way the party typically conducts uh, interrogation and, um, you know, reform of, of an individual. You know, you go down, you, you go to a labor camp, they don't just beat you to death or they don't beat a confession out of you. They change your mind. And they do this through relentless confession, relentless psychological pressure. It's very intimidating and vicious and nasty, but it's not as crude as just beating you. At the end, they don't just want your submission physically. They want the submission of your mind. And uh, one of the reasons we keep underestimating the strength of purpose of the Chinese communists is that we... We look on the Communist Party like it's a corrupt set of gangsters, uh, you know, like some other third world dictatorship or something like that. It is partly that. There's an enormous amount of corruption. And for a lot of people, these beliefs mean nothing and so forth. But there is at its core the alarm, the spirit and the purpose of one of the great world religions. And there are almost as many people under Chinese communism as there are Christians in the entire world. So communism as a religion has not, um, has not failed in the way that we'd like it to fail. And then there are half a dozen other communist countries to North Korea and, and Cuba and Vietnam and so on. And uh, I think this perspective on the Chinese communists helps explain why they are so uh, hateful towards Christianity. They, it's, they do see Christianity as a foreign religion and foreign gods, but they, they care about Christianity not so much because it appeals to the marginalised, although it certainly does that, but because it appeals to well-educated Chinese who find no meaning at all in communism and no meaning at all in the aesthetics of the Chinese Communist Party and who have the normal human yearning for meaning and find meaning in Christianity. The communists find that a tremendous threat and they're extremely uneasy all the time about the presence and growth of Christianity. A couple of hundred years ago, for a brief period, they saw Christians as an element of modernization. So the first Jesuits who went into China, Matteo Ricci and so on. I recount one of the dialogues between a Chinese emperor and one of Ricci's successors, one of the, one of the Jesuits. At first, they thought, well, these Jesuits know a lot about astronomy and books and so on. Let's, let's see what we can learn from them. But very early on, they were very uh, suspicious of, um, of them as an alien cultural influence. And I think the Communist Party now sees them as a competitor in um, explaining the universe, explaining the meaning of life to Chinese citizens. A Chinese lady, an academic in Singapore, told me 10 years ago that the best chance for a peaceful new order globally was the rise of the church in China. It was an interesting reflection, a Chinese academic lady. Uh, so what happens in China is very, very important for all of us. I think we would agree. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.